to do. Now, of course, that's only part of the equation. Once you have the large number of hadrons being created, you'd like to have some experiments that will try to measure the properties of those particles as they come out. So what I'll be talking about today is the, the physics of the particle detectors and the particle detectors themselves. I want to focus a little bit on the physics of how the particles are detected in the experiment specifically because while it's true that we know how to detect particles like electrons and uh, muons and the standard model particles, we may have new models someday where the, part, the interactions of the particles with the detector material itself may be very different than what we have in the standard model. So I'd like just to present how we know that the particles interact in certain ways. And at the end, I'll give you a few examples of new particles that have been proposed in some models that would have very different interactions than our normal standard model particles. So it's important not only to know how the detectors work, but also to know the physics behind the interactions in those detectors. Okay. Of course, the goal is to try to measure the four vector of each particle. And the four vector can mean different things. Well, formally, I guess we all know what the four vector is. It should be the four momentum. But practically, things, if you want to just change the variables around, you could measure the three vector plus the mass. So that would tell you which particle it is and what its three momentum is. You can measure the, the momentum and the energy. All these things are equivalent. You can measure the eta phi that Matt Schrassler talked about this morning in addition to the energy and get the PT, which would give you the momentum together with the eta and phi, actually together with the eta. Um, so the goal of the detector is really to measure these four vectors. Not simply to measure the three vectors, but actually if we can to measure the whole four vector, that is the momentum and the energy, or equivalently the momentum and the mass, or the energy and the mass. Okay. So it's not only a case of just measuring these three vectors, but trying to figure out which particles they are at the same time. For all these particles, we'll be uh, trying to measure the momentum, that is the three momentum, in the spectrometer, so the magnetic field, and we'll talk about that in a second. It's also possible to measure the velocity directly. So we know that these particles have velocities close to the speed of light, beta very close to one, uh, gamma much greater than one. But if gamma is not too much greater than one and beta is not too close to the speed of light, we can actually measure the small differences using very precise timing. So we were talking about picosecond resolution timing this morning. If we can do that, then we have a chance of measuring the different masses of the particles. So that's what we would do with timing. Uh, the, probably the most important way that we have to measure the particle type is to try to estimate the amount of energy that's lost as it passes through the detector. So we'll see that this is the so-called DEDX, and different particle types have different DEDX because they have different betas. So again, it all comes back to that, that beta measurement or gamma measurement in certain cases. All right. The two kinds of measurements that I'll talk about today are basically going to divide the two different kinds of, of subsystems in the different experiments. Each experiment, let me get my chalk here. It kind of goes without saying. I, I think a lot of you have seen pictures of these experiments. But each of the experiments is basically like an onion with different subdetector systems inside the experiment itself. So we talk about the ATLAS experiment or the ATLAS detector, but actually there are separate subsystems inside the ATLAS detector or the CMS detector. Uh, I'll be concentrating on those two actually today. So the kinds of detectors that do what I would call non-destructive measurements are actually measuring the energy that's left behind the particles as they pass through. So these will include the tracking detectors mostly. The destructive measurements are the kinds that really are final measurements. The calorimeters are an example of that. The particle really doesn't exist as it originally came out of the collision after it interacts in the calorimeter. So that's an example of a destructive measurement. So in order to really see the interactions of the particles with the detector, we have to have some particle interactions. If we don't have any particle interactions, for example, with the neutrinos, then we just don't see them in the detector. There's no record of them having passed through the detector. So the key to being able to see the particle interactions is to, to count on some very large cross-section interactions. So we talked about things that are small cross-sections, rare processes, things that are weak interactions are, are typically very small cross-section processes. But in order to track the particles passage through the detectors, we'd like to look for very large cross-section interactions instead. So two of the largest uh, cross-section interactions are the electromagnetic interaction, uh, whenever the particle comes near a, um, an, an atom and can interact electrically with that at short range. 
Uh, the strong and nuclear interaction is also a very large cross-section process. And that's a large cross-section process that, that scales roughly with the, the atomic number of the material, atomic number, atomic weight. So we'll be talking about both of those and using both of those interactions and in trying to track the particles as they go through the detector. I found it very interesting in preparing this lecture is to find this kind of numerology. Actually, it's real physics scaling. If you think about the differences between what happens when you have an interaction with an atom, which is what we expect for the electromagnetic interaction, versus the interaction with a nucleon, if you look at the difference in their, their radii and uh, the difference in their, their cross-section, you see something that's about a factor of 10. Well, this is also the same as the factor that you have difference between the energy scales going from electron volts, which is what you expect for atoms. Think about the ionization energy, for example, of an electron in an atom, versus the nuclear binding energy, which is on the order of GeV, those atomic mass units. And the reason that that's true is if you look up there at the, the H bar C conversion constant, that actually has the units GeV and millibarns in that constant there. So you can see the rough uh, scaling between the two. And these are, in fact, the two interactions that we'll be looking at. Okay. So first I'll talk about the non-destructive measurements. Again, the key to measuring the, the charged particle momenta, remember the Lorentz force is only acting on the charged particles, so these are the only ones that will actually curve in a spectrometer. Let's think about uh, what exactly that curvature looks like. So let's imagine that I have a, a particle that's coming into my detector. Actually, let me... Just use my detector here, shall I? So typically what we have is we have a, a cylindrical geometry that you've probably seen before on the detectors. And typically the magnetic field that we have is a solenoidal field. So the solenoidal field guarantees that any of the particles that are coming out transverse to the beam line will feel a Lorentz force and be curved in that solenoidal field. It also guarantees that particles that are coming out along the beam line won't be affected by the solenoidal field. And this is very important when you have the beams going through the solenoidal field. Okay. So you wouldn't like those beams to necessarily be curving around inside the magnetic field. Uh, there is an effect of the beams, by the way, effect on the beams by the experiment solenoidal field. But as long as the transverse motion is very small whenever the beams go through the detector, that, that's minimal. So the important thing for the curvature of these particles, let me draw the particle itself here. The important thing as the particle moves along is to try to measure the magnitude of the curvature, try to measure the radius of curvature of this particle. And really, we don't measure the curvature itself. I mean, the curvature would be trying to do some sort of uh, fit here through some whole circle. What's really important is that we try to see how close or how far away this curved track is from a straight line. So if I have a very, very high momentum, high transverse <coughs> momentum particle, I should mention that. Let's say that the B field is coming out here. Um, here's my B field. The key is that the curvature, due to the Lorentz force, will be proportional to the transverse momentum of the particle. The longitudinal momentum won't feel any effect or won't give rise to any Lorentz force. So really what we're measuring is only the PT, transverse momentum. That's why whenever you see me talking later about PT and ET, number one is because what we measure in the solenoidal field. Number two, it's because it's very convenient, as you saw from the kinematics this morning, to always do the measurements in the transverse plane. That's the plane where you know the initial momentum, and you don't have to worry about the unknown boost in the Z direction. Okay. So the thing that we actually measure, and the derivation of the resolution on this tracking momentum measurement, actually comes from the sagitta. So you all know that the chord, for example, would be the length, the straight line between these two, as opposed to the arc length, which would be the L coming here. So the sagitta here is the difference between the arc length and the chord. And an exercise for the reader then is to, to show that the sagitta is proportional not only to the B field, it seems very clear that if I increase the B field, I'll go from having a track that's roughly straight to one that's slightly curved to one that's more and more curved because Lorentz force will become stronger and stronger. But also uh, proportional to L squared, where L is the arc length. So basically what this means is that if I have a track that is... Oh, okay. I, I'm happy with this chalk. I was just looking for the eraser. 
You can't see this. OK. I think that this chalk is the same as the chalk over here, but I will, I will take a new piece. I want everyone to be able to see. Maybe I'll just press harder, OK? All right. If I have a particle that has some curvature over a long scale L, basically what I'm saying by saying that the sagitta scales as L squared is that if I were looking at a very, very small piece of it, let's say that I do all my measurements of the track position down here. On this very short scale, I don't have any way of measuring the curvature. Or in other words, this would look like a sh just a straight track, something with infinite momentum, no curvature. It's only as I put more measuring stations out here and measure these points on the track that I'm able to see that, in fact, I do have a substantial curvature. So if you're wondering in advance why the muon detectors are so big on these experiments, this is basically the reason why. We're trying to measure the, the small curvature of a very high PT muon. And we do that by having points that are measured near the interaction point and then points that are measured very far away. So this is why I made the statement yesterday saying, even if we could have accelerators that were tabletop accelerators, if they're producing TeV particles for which we want to measure a very small curvature, we still need to have either a very large B or a modestly large L. And you can see that you win actually by having L increase. If you increase L by a factor of two, it's a lot better than increasing B by a factor of two. Now, this is one place where the two experiments differ, the ATLAS and CMS experiment. ATLAS has chosen to increase L, especially for the muons, and CMS chose to increase B. The B field in CMS is about twice the size of the ATLAS B field, 4 Tesla versus 2 Tesla. Okay. So you can see the numbers that you expect for the sigida there in CMS. This is for a 100 GeV particle. Now, as far as the physics goes, if what you want to measure is you want to measure accurately a 1 TeV muon, something that's coming from the Terra scale. Maybe you have a Z prime that's decaying to two muons. Well, if, if the Z prime is on the order of TeV, then this, these muons will be upwards of 500 GeV, depending on where exactly the Z prime is. In order to get a good measurement of the mass of this Z prime and actually say that you have some discovery, you'd like to have a very good resolution, let's say at least a 10% resolution on the momentum, the transverse momenta, of these two muons as they're coming out from the Z prime. So this sets a requirement on how well you should measure the sigitta. And the resolution on the curvature, which is, after all, proportional to the uh, Q over PT is the curvature. The resolution on that depends on how well you can measure the sigitta. So in other words, if I have a, let's say I'm trying to measure the difference from a straight line here, measuring the sigitta corresponds to how well I measure this point here. Okay. So it gives us something to shoot for for our detectors. If we're looking for a 50 micron resolution on the Sagitta measurement, it means that we better know the position of the intercept between the track and the detector plane at better than 50 microns. Yes, question? Absolutely. So both experiments were designed to achieve that resolution. Uh, and that's exactly why they're so big. And you might say, well, couldn't you make it smaller? You can make it smaller, but then what would happen is you'd only be measuring a few points along the muon, and you wouldn't have the momentum resolution that you want. So both Atlas and CMS achieve this in different ways. Maybe Atlas is a little bit better because the, the L squared gains you more than the B. OK, so how exactly are these things measured? I said that we're measuring the points uh, we're measuring some points on the track and, and measuring how the particle, or exactly where the particle passes through matter. How exactly do we measure this? Well, all these charged particles will lose energy through the electromagnetic interaction. Basically, they will ionize. Well, actually, two things happen, I should say. So the first is that you have some scattering off of the charge centers. They might be in the gas. They might be in, in something that's a little more solid. Almost always, they're in a gas. Um, let me think. Is that true? No, actually, they're, we'll see the next case, the next slide. They're actually in a solid, too, the next few slides. So wherever the charge centers are, in a gas or in a solid, and this, elect, this elastic scattering through the electromagnetic interaction, basically what we have is we have a, a particle coming through here. Let's say it's a, a pion, for example. 
and this pion is interacting with the, the charge center through the electromagnetic interaction. Okay, So this pion actually gets a little bit of a kick. And to satisfy momentum conservation, then this charge center also has to get a little bit of a kick. So this elastic scattering increases with the amount of the material. That's not very surprising. The angle, the, the RMS of the angle through which these particles are scattered. Um, and you can calculate exactly what is the kick that each one of these particles would get from the so-called multiple scattering. Basically what it means is that if you have a big block of material and you send a particle in at zero angle, the particle will come out with some spread of angles. In other words, it has the possibility to be knocked around by these charge centers in an electromagnetic interaction, and then it comes out in some range. So the width of this distribution then is proportional to the amount of material, the number of charge centers n that's in that equation there. Okay. I guess I should go back. The other thing that happens with the charged particles is that they lose energy. So not only do they scatter, not only do they change direction, but they even lose energy. And this energy is due to, to ionization of the gas, for example. Let's just uh, take an example of that. So you have your, your nucleus here. You have ionization of the gas. Basically, your electron gets kicked up. And eventually, it will fall back down. But actually, sometimes it will just be ejected completely, which is what we're looking for in this case. So let me just draw it like this. That we're just going to eject this electron out of the atom. So what happens is the particle comes by. It interacts here uh, with the electron okay, through the electromagnetic interaction. And some energy is lost by the particle. So if you were to look at the curvature, the curvature will increase ever so slightly for the, for the particle after it loses a little bit of energy to ionize the electron or ionize the hydrogen atom. So the magnitude of this energy loss is proportional to the z of the material that's uh, interacting with the particle. Uh, but most importantly, it goes as 1 over beta squared. So this means that the particles that are uh, slower will actually have a larger energy loss due to ionization. And usually this is described as thinking about the particle spending uh, a little bit more time in the electric field of the, of the material here. Okay, so this is the so-called beta block formula. All of the ionization detectors that we'll be using depend on this dE dx. That's the energy loss per centimeter, if you like, as you move through the material. And there's some scaling there for the density. But uh, uh, usually people talk about this dE dx, and they'll write it in the units that are in this dE d rho x. You'll see this on the next page. Question. Yes. as it's curving. Uh, for the muon, no. We'll actually get to this in a second. Uh, for the muon, no. It turns out that the synchrotron radiation, if you remember from last time, was basically going as 1 over m to the fourth. So it turns out that the only particle which really radiates is the electron. Um, the next lightest particle, you're right, would be the muon. But it turns out that this m to the fourth is enough to make sure the muons don't radiate, except if the muons get up around 1 TeV, and then they can radiate. So for the first time at the LHC, we're in the regime where the muons themselves can radiate. And that's usually news to people. But that's what happens when you're at very high energies. You get into a different regime. Can you get Shrinkoff radiation? Can you get shrink off radiation? Uh, technically, yes, but I guess practically, no. So you should get uh, shrink off radiation if the particle velocities exceed C over N. right? And so N, in this case, would be whatever the index of refraction is for a rather low pressure hydrogen gas which is pretty close to 1. So you can get Cherenkov radiation in certain detectors that use a pressurized gas, where N is just big enough to, to make sure that the, the fast particles will emit Cherenkov radiation. So there are some detectors that use Cherenkov radiation. Neither CMS nor ATLAS really uses Cherenkov radiation. Um, ATLAS uses something different called transition radiation, a transition radiation detector that is basically emitting radiation where there's a change in index of refraction. So a little bit different from Cherenkov radiation. And you're right, both Cherenkov radiation and this transition radiation can give you some insight into the particle type because they both depend on the gamma of the particle. Well, actually, Cherenkov radiation depends on the beta, but the, well, I guess it also depends on the gamma. Okay.
So the energy loss plot that I just promised, the DEDX that you see here, DEDX, you can see it's actually in the units of DED rho x, if you look at the per gram centimeter squared. What you see here is that you see you have different amounts of ionization energy loss for different particles. And the reason is that since it depends on the beta, different particles will have different beta for the same momentum. So let's look at the momentum here. Let's look at 1 GeV for the different particles. So for a proton, a momentum 1 GeV corresponds to a low beta. Uh, it's a gamma that would be uh, basically getting close to 1. Uh, whereas for the pion, a 1 GeV uh, momentum corresponds to a high beta, so a beta that's up close to 10. So as you would expect or from the formula, you have very different DEDX for these two different kinds of particles, the pion and the proton, at the same momentum. So the proton momentum 1 would give you a DEDX up here, and pion momentum 1 would give you a DEDX there. The DEDX changes for the different uh, radiators, if we want to call them, well, not radiators, let's call them uh, the ionizing uh, medium. So for hydrogen, helium, and uh, the DEDX can, the particles lose energy through ionization even in solid material. So things like the metals. Okay. Yes? What about the neutral particles? Neutral particles. So the neutral particles, good question, the neutral particles don't feel the electromagnetic interaction because that depends on the charge of the particles. So in other words, I only have an electromagnetic interaction here if there's a charge for this incoming particle. Right? So there should be basically an alpha here and an alpha here, and the alpha depends on those charges. Okay. Now you could also ask what happens if the particle happened to have a charge different than one? Would the ionization loss be greater or smaller? And we'll come back to that at the end. But the neutral particles don't have any ionization loss through this mechanism like this. So we cannot. I think your question was, we cannot measure the neutral particle momentum with the magnetic field either. So, so far I haven't shown you how to measure neutral particles. Was that the question? OK. But we will come to that. There are ways to measure the neutral particles, the neutral particles that interact strongly. OK. I just want to be surprised that the energy loss in lead is less than that in the DEDX. <laughs> that the energy loss in lead. Well, let's go back to the formula here. See if it makes sense. So I think that the reason, one of the reasons that this is happening is because the Z over A is different between those two. So Z over A is close to one for helium. Let's see if that makes enough of a difference here. It's a good question. Whereas it's closer probably to two once you get up to lead. Uh, that probably does not explain the whole difference, does it? Oh, actually it comes close, it comes close. The density, right. Yeah, that's true. So there's one other thing I should point out here. The dip that you see, the minimum in the ionization energy loss, is for what we call the minimum ionization. So a particle that happens to be in that regime there, around a beta gamma of 3, is what we would call a minimum ionizing particle. That's the least amount of energy that a particle will deposit. So now let's get to the charged particle detector. Someone pointed out uh, correctly that these detectors that operate via ionization energy loss will only be for charged particles. There's a question up here first. Um, is there any explanation why there's that dip? Yeah, I kind of uh, skipped over that, that point there. If you look up the full formula here for the, the beta block formula, you'll see that that dip actually comes out of this function. Uh, probably in the logarithms that I, actually, that I actually have there. So what happens is that the particles that are up here on this part, I guess my pointer is a little bit flaky here. No, it's kind of working, intermittently working. Um, yeah, well, can I, shall I just leave it at that and say that it comes out of the formula there? The explanation about why it's there actually is not so relevant to our discussion today. Um, what's important is that you can tell the difference for the different beta gammas 
depending on where you are. Well, the different particle types will give you different beta gammas that you can look for um, if you know the particle momentum. Uh, actually, we should talk about this afterwards because there are some subtleties about the shape of the plot that can be interesting too. You notice that whenever you go to very high beta gamma, the, the particles will all kind of go together. I mean, the pions and muons and the, since, the, since it kind of flattens out, you won't have as easy a time telling the different particles about, apart at beta gamma. So the place where it's most easy to tell them apart is at relatively low beta gamma because there's a big difference between the beta gamma of three and the beta gamma of one and a beta gamma of uh, 10. Once you get up around beta gammas of above 10, then the slope starts to, uh, to become more shallow. Okay, let me move on. So the charged particle detectors are using this effect. They're using this very large cross-section interaction to try to see what happens whenever a little bit of energy is lost to the ionization. So let me draw what happens there. Basically what we have is we have a gas volume through which the particle passes. So here's our, our gas volume. And let's say we have a particle that comes through here like this. This is our charged particle. So our charged particle will undergo energy loss through ionization. And it, it, this energy loss, if you think about it, works both ways. Not only do we see the energy loss from the particle itself, but that energy loss from the particle is manifested as energy gained by the ions. So what we actually get is we get the ionized electrons, the ionization electrons that are formed along the path here of the particle. Okay? So where before we had a neutral, uh, a neutral system with no ions before the particle passed, now because of the ionization energy loss in the hydrogen, let's say, we have charges now that can drift through the system. If we didn't do anything with the system, those charges would just recombine with their, their cations. But in fact, what we'll do is we'll apply an electric field. And this is the way that the, the bulk of the detectors were originally designed and still continue to be used today. So let's think about some electric field that we have here. And this electric field is proportional to one over R. So what it means is that I have a very strong electric field near the center of the chamber if the electric field is radial from the, from the center of the chamber. In fact, this might be a wire. It's a wire that's held at a certain potential to give us this electric field. So this is a conducting shell. This is a wire here. And we get a radial electric field. So what we find is that we have a drift of the charges so let's say the drift of the charges is in this direction, down towards the, the center of this wire. So the charges start drifting down towards the wire. And as they encounter very strong electric fields, because we have the 1 over R as, it, as they get close to the wire, we actually get an avalanche effect where the ions are accelerated into other atoms of the hydrogen and cause a sort of an avalanche amplification effect. So that instead of just having the original ions, or the original electrons, that came from the passage of the particle, we now have secondary electrons that are produced by the avalanche of amplification or acceleration of the original electrons. So what it means is that from going from one, uh, each ionization electron that was produced by the particle gets ramped up to n, part or n electrons at the wire before they're collected. And this difference going from 1 to n is called the gain. So these are high gain detectors, meaning that even a very small amount of ionization energy can be picked up by the detector electronics. Okay, you might ask what happens after this. Well, by knowing the time that it takes for these particles to drift down, we can estimate how far away from the center of the wire this particle passed. Okay. And so if I wanted to, for example, measure the sigita of this muon over here, I could just have a bunch of tubes with a wire going down the middle of each one. And to first order, I would be interested in knowing through which tube 
the particle passed. And that would be enough to give me a very gross estimate of where the particle passed in this plane of tubes. But to second order, I could ask the question, where did it pass within the tube? That is, based on the time that it takes for these electrons to come out of the avalanche, to drift an avalanche, how far away from the center of the tube am I? So I'm able to get a resolution on the position of the track as it passes this detector plane that is less than the radius of the tube itself. Okay. So this is exactly how the detectors work for the muon systems at ATLAS and CMS. Okay. So we have these, these planes of, of tubes, at least in ATLAS, and then we're looking for the particle passing through each one of these tubes in the plane. Okay, there's a question here. Um, how large is the gas of the magnetic field from the detection of the gas Aha. Um, that, that's an interesting question. The electric field on the charged particles. Usually we think only about the, the Lorentz force from the B field. Since the B field is in Tesla, that is a much bigger effect than the effect from the, the electric field itself. Since the electric field itself is only, let's say, a few hundred volts up to kilovolts. Um, so yeah, that the magnetic force really dominates over any force that you would have from the electric field. Uh, I guess if you were very, very close to the wire, like going right through the wire, then you might have something. But uh, in that case, you would be passing right through and you wouldn't feel any force at all, right? So, was there another comment or a question up there? Yes. The way that you know when the particle entered the tube is basically you know when the particle was produced down here, okay? So, one way to know is to know when the collision happened in the first place. So we do know when the collisions happen. They're happening every 25 nanoseconds at LHC. So we have a good idea from which collision this particle came. You may say, oh, well, the particle could have curved. Well, since the collisions are 25 nanoseconds apart, that means that the successive particles coming from successive collisions couldn't be closer than 25 feet in radius from each other. So as long as you, you have a better time resolution than that, you won't get confused about which particles are coming from which bunch crossing. So you know when the particle is produced, and then you can figure out how long it would take to get there. And so you know when to, to start the clock on the, on the chamber there. So you can figure out from the geometry how long it would have taken to get there, and then you figure out how long the drift was. And you do this for many of the tubes all at once, so you can cross-calibrate what's called the T0, the time at which the particle started its trajectory. You mean so you could have one particle come like this and the other particle come like that? And I would have two particles go through the same tube? No, no, oh. At the same time. Okay. We're actually going to talk a lot about that uh, later on. So the question was what happens if you have two particle collisions? So they might be two proton-proton collisions, or they might be partons inside the same proton. There's nothing you can do about that. I mean, you can, um, actually, we will come back to that, but let me, let me answer very quickly. If the particles are from two separate proton-proton collisions, they may be slightly separated in Z. Okay? So the particles that you measure may point back to different interaction points different primary vertices that we call them, okay? If they're coming from the same primary vertex, then they, that's all part of the same collision, and you have to take that into account. We'll actually come to this a little bit later on. That is true, too. So we'll come back to that whenever we talk about the, the, the multiple interactions. That is true. Yes? Pardon me? Yes? from a regular vertex. The question was how we distinguish the displaced vertex from a regular vertex. So if the particles are coming through, let's say that I have a, 
a, a vertex down here. If I find a track that comes through like this, or I reconstruct a charged particle that comes through like that, then you're right, I know that it doesn't come from the vertex. In fact, this happens all the time in the detector from cosmic rays. Cosmic rays certainly are charged particles that come through the detector, they're muons, and they don't come from the interaction point. They don't come from the primary vertex. So those are reconstructed, albeit with a lower efficiency than the particles that come from the primary vertex. That actually is a little bit of a problem. That's going to be one of our challenges at the end of the talk today to, to uh, try to figure out what signatures may not be reconstructed as efficiently as others and whether they're important. Okay. So another example of the charged particle detector is one that uses not gas as its ionization volume, but a solid state material instead. And in fact, this is a little bit different than ionization itself. It's still energy loss due to or it's still energy loss due to an electromagnetic interaction, but I won't call it ionization in exactly the same way. If we think about what happens in silicon, so a, a semiconductor, the analog, if you want, to the ionization is the promotion of the electron up to the conduction band. So the electron promoted up to the conduction band leaves behind a hole. And these electron hole pairs kind of act as charge carriers themselves. Well, the electrons are charges, but the holes are kind of the anti-charges. So if a particle passes through a solid state detector like this, it leaves, I'm afraid I didn't fully show you all the charges in the figure. Let me show you how those would work. Let's take a slab of silicon, for example. And the particle passes through here. So the particle liberates these electron hole pairs. And these electron hole pairs are liberated by taking energy away from the particle. Basically, the particle loses energy as it creates these electron hole pairs. These electron hole pairs can drift to one side or the other under, the, under some applied electric field, if we apply an electric field. And the electric field can go in. Um, why have I drawn it here? Electric field can go in this direction. So if we apply an electric field, we'll have electron hole pairs drift, but they won't avalanche. And the reason they won't avalanche is that this is a constant electric field as opposed to this field over here, which became stronger as the electrons approach the wire. So here we have electron hole pairs that are just drifting to the edges of the detector where they can be picked up and read out as signal. And so this kind of device is called a unity gain device. That is, instead of going from 1 to n, it's every produced electron hole pair is read out as a charge, not avalanched. Now you might imagine that this makes things a little bit more difficult, because instead of getting one ionization electron multiplied to n, which are easy to read out, you only can read out what you started with, what the particle produced. So that's the bad news. The good news is that because it's solid state, you may think that you have a, a larger DEDX because of the density effect. And, but in fact, what you really need is you really need sensitive electronics here to read out the charge. So in fact, let me show you what exactly you need. Pardon me? Sense of dimensions, thank you, Michael. So a typical dimension here, basically the dimensions are set by how many electron hole pairs you need to read out. So remember, it's DEDX. So if I want to increase the electron hole pairs, I need more energy to be lost from the particle, which means I need to increase the amount of material the particle traverses. So a typical scale that's found to be necessary to get enough electron hole pairs for readout is something like 300 microns thick, somewhere between 250 and 300 microns. So we're talking something that's very fine here. And the readout elements that we have at which the electron hole pairs are collected are between 50 and 100 microns apart. Let's put 50 microns apart is the distance between these successive readout elements where the electron hole pairs are collected. So think of each one of these 50 micron separated elements as being the analog to each one of these tubes in the tracking chambers, in the individual tubes set up. 
So what it means is the particle goes through here. We can figure out pretty easily that it must have gone between these three readout elements because it was moving electron hole pairs to here and to here. So I will have a result or a charge on these three readout elements. And from that, I have a pretty good idea about where the particle passed. It passed somewhere in between those three. So someone was asking if we can achieve that 50 microns resolution on those muons. Certainly, this is one reason. In fact, we achieve much better than 50 microns. Okay. So the time information here, uh, it, it's essentially the physical time itself is only what happens with the electron hole pair drift time, which is very short because it's only only 300 microns. So this is much faster than these tubes that are more macroscopic. Um, but in fact, we have a trick that can stretch the time out. So the simple answer is no, the silicon detectors aren't really used for the timing in, in this way. You know exactly when the particle went through, if that's what you mean. So if you know what the T0 is, you can measure exactly when the particle went through. But you don't use the timing information like we did over here to get some sort of sub-detector element resolution. There is another way to get sub-detector element resolution, though, and that's on the next page. So if you read out the different tracking detectors and you get different results on these different readouts, so let me write again here my three readout elements. Okay, here's my particle going through. Let's say that, for example, in arbitrary units, I read out something like um, three units of charge collected here and five units of charge collected here and one unit of charge collected here. So based on this sort of uh, charge division between the readout elements, I somehow have a vague idea that the uh, particle must have passed must have created more electron hole pairs on the center element than on either of these two outer elements. And in fact, the fact that this is much smaller than this one kind of leads us to believe that it probably came through between numbers three and five with a little bit, I guess I've actually drawn it correctly, with a little bit of um, loss over here on readout element number one. This one is mark number one. Okay, So this kind of charge division can give you sub element resolution, position resolution, if you're able to keep track of how much charge you read out on each one of these readout elements. So there are two different ways to read it out. One is called the binary readout, where you only say yes or no on each one of these elements. And the other is a so-called time over threshold, which is explained up above, that lets you read out exactly how much charge you, re you collected on each one of these elements. So by using charge division, you can get some sub-element resolution there. Okay. And there you have the total expected charge for the 300 micron detector. So five femtocoulombs is not impossible to, to read out. Now if you can measure the charge that is on each one of these readout elements, you basically have a measure of the DEDX of the particle. Here's the X of the particle. It's the path length that the particle traversed in the solid state detector. And you have a readout of the E through the charge. So remember the E is the energy that's lost by the particle. That's converted to some number of electron hole pairs through the conversion factor that we know, 3.6 EV per electron hole pair. We can calculate the total amount of energy lost by the particle. We know the dx, so we have measured the de dx of the particle in these silicon detectors, in these solid state detectors. So by plotting that de dx as a function of the particle momentum, we go back and recover those DEDX curves that you saw a couple pages back. So this plot over here is, is theory. In other words, what you expect for different particle species. Let me see if the, the pointer will work now. Okay, so we have a, a proton, electron, kaon, pion, muon. So these different particle types have different curves because of their different gammas. You can see that the pion and the muons are close together because their masses are close together. And this is actual data. This is data from the Atlas pixel detector. And you can see the different curves. Okay, So the electrons are this fuzzy bar down here, a lot of, uh, of electrons in here. And the dip itself is not so evident in this plot because everything is basically all smeared together. But you can see different particle species in these different bands here. 
So this is one way that we have to tell apart different particle species. Uh, you won't be surprised to learn that it's very hard for us to separate the muons and pions statistically because they're so close to each other. But what's really important is if we're able to separate electrons from the other species and sometimes pions from kaons is useful. So pions and kaons are pretty well separated and that's one application of DED access to do particle identification for those hadrons. That's a good point. The separation only happens at low momentum, where the low momentum is, uh, yeah, actually here. Well, the separation, that's true, it happens at low momentum. The thing that saves you is that the circumstances under which you would want to do the separation are if you have um, uh, signatures that are relatively low mass, so something where you would have uh, two pions, let's say, or, or two kaons, or k pi. And these are typically low energy applications, so low momentum. Another way to think about it is these pions and kaons are produced inside a jet of particles. And the particles themselves that are inside the jet are not anywhere near the energy of the leptons or the jets that come out of the hard scatter. And I think that Matt will, will talk about that tomorrow. If you look at the momentum distribution of the particles that are in the shower, each particle carries only a small fraction of the original parton energy. So the energies that we're really talking about for these individual particles are typically on the order of GeV. Okay. So it's true that above that, the separation is not so good. Separation is very good below that, though. Okay. Okay, we should move on. So what we've talked about so far are the tracking detectors, and these are specifically the detectors that measure the momentum of the charged particles, momentum and then the, the particle type of the charged particles. So let's move on to how we might measure the neutral particles. So basically there are two kinds of interactions that neutral particles can undergo. Obviously there's the electromagnetic interaction and there's the strong interaction. We're going to ignore the weak interaction because it's not a large cross-section interaction. In other words, we can't count on it to give uh, a lot of, of hits in our detector. So if we stick to the, the large cross-section interactions, for electromagnetically interacting particles, neutral particles, basically photons, the well, photons and electrons, you have these two interactions. One is Bremsstrahlung, which is the radiation of a photon off the charged particle. Okay. So for electrons, we can have a Bremsstrahlung photon radiated off of the electron or positron. So some energy will be lost by the electron in that case. Energy goes into the photon, obviously. And the other case is we have pair production. So pair production, if you like, is the same vertex here, the e, e, minus, uh, e minus gamma vertex, e gamma vertex, except now, this time, it's a conversion of a photon into an e plus e minus pair. So the photon comes in, in the presence of a nucleus, it converts to an E plus E minus pair. So that's another key, that this only happens in the presence of a nucleus, otherwise you can't conserve momentum in this uh, reaction here. But in the calorimeter, we do have material, we do have nuclei that are able to absorb some of this momentum, so this can happen. The Bremsstrahlung uh, energy loss is dependent on this x0. x0 is a measure of the amount of material that's been traversed. So actually, x over x0 is a, is a measure of the amount of material traversed. x0 is called the radiation length. So if a, part, if a material has a very short radiation length, then x over x0 will be large, and then this exponential will be small, so there will be a large energy loss due to Bremsstrahlung in that material. So think of a material like lead, for example, has a very short radiation length. Something like hydrogen gas would have a very long radiation length. And that's a good thing because if we've passed our particle through hydrogen gas in our tracker before we got to the calorimeter, we don't want it to lose all of its energy in the, in the tractor, in the hydrogen gas. We want it to lose it in the lead of the calorimeter. Okay. So these two processes, the Bremsstrahlung and the pair production, are what actually give us the showers 
in the calorimeter. Let's see how that works exactly. So let's say I have an electron coming in from the side. The electron can radiate a photon, and then it continues on its path. The photon can convert into a E minus E plus pair. Each one of these can radiate. And then these photons can convert again. Don't forget this one down here, which is still radiating and converting. What you have is you have a shower of electrons and photons in this calorimeter. And basically, each time that you come to a branching point, you get a doubling of particles. Okay? And very roughly, these interactions happen approximately once per radiation length. That's the scale that we're looking at there. So the energy loss happens because these interactions are happening at the scale of the radiation length. So each of these generations happens at the next radiation length, and we get another factor of two particles in the shower. Now this can only continue for so long, because the problem is that eventually the energies of these particles will fall below what's called the critical energy. And this critical energy is the energy at which the ionization loss is equal to the I have it written up there. I have the, next one. the ionization loss is equal to the loss through Bremster lung and pair production. Okay. What that means is that instead of losing energy by the splitting, these particles will just lose energy by ionization and they'll lose all their momentum and the, the shower will die away. In other words, there's no more energy to continue the shower. The shower can only continue when these photons have enough energy to make an electron-positron pair. Okay. So this will continue if E gamma is at least 2 me. Otherwise, if these photons are falling below the critical energy, um, then the ionization loss takes over, and the photons will, will basically, uh, well, Actually, they'll probably thermalize in the absorber. But we'll talk about that. So what happens, as you can see in the pictures here, you have a growth of the shower as it moves along in radiation length. And then at some point, the shower will die out because there's not enough energy left to, to continue their pair production Bremster lung cycle. So the, the shower will eventually die out there. The goal of the detectors is to design them long enough so that they fully contain the shower. And the reason is, if you fully contain the shower, you believe that you got all the energy of the incoming particle. Okay? So the energy of the incoming particle really is, is uh, fully contained in this volume. So here we see showers for uh, 24 GeV electron in iron and uh, 8 GeV electron in cesium iodide. Okay. Hydronic showers are similar except instead of EM interactions, Bremster lung and pair production, they're nuclear interactions. Yes? No. The question is whether it's destructive to the detector, too, and not just the particles. No, because the reason is that the, the, um, the interaction is really the electromagnetic interaction that dominates here, not the not any sort of uh, destructive nuclear spallation, which is what I think you might be thinking of. You're thinking about maybe displacing things in the metal and if you have a high enough energy particle. No. So these, these, are, um, these are only having to do with the scattering off of the, the charges, right? That's what this electromagnetic interaction is. So there isn't any, any fission of the nucleus or anything like that that would be actually changing the nuclear aspects of the material. Okay. So that, as far as ionization, you would just have another electron come in and recombine eventually with it. Okay. Question? Uh, related question. How long does the detector take to relax between, between events? Yeah. So that's, that's actually a good question. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer for you right now, but uh, I could... I think I'll have to get back to you on that because these should develop very quickly. The thing that might not develop so quickly is the 
these detectors are read out by reading out the ionization. And if the ionization has some drift time, then that would actually set the time scale for the, the, um, the dead time of the detector. Okay. But as far as the physics itself, that this propagation is not really, um, is not really a limiting factor. Okay. There was a question up there. It was the same question. Okay. But let me double check that. I will I'll double check that tonight and I'll get back to you tomorrow on that. Okay. Yes. As segmented as you would like them to be. The only limitation is that each segment needs to have an electronics channel to read it out. So practically speaking, the segments that we have there, at least in Atlas, are something like 0 0.025 by 0 0.025 radians in phi and eta. Actually, you know, they have different they have different sizes depending on where you are on the calorimeter. Um, for CMS, I'd have to look it up, Michael. That's a good question. Okay. Approximately the same. So, in fact, you the size of this is is roughly set by the lateral size of the shower, which spreads out. And I'm not talking about that today, but there there is a, a characteristic lateral scale for these showers. And you'd like your detector elements to be roughly on that scale. There's no point in making them smaller than that scale because the shower itself will be larger than that scale. So if you can make your, your readout elements about that size, then that will be the optimum thing. All right, let me move on. The one thing I want to, uh, to emphasize here, and I haven't said yet, so let me say it, is that the energy of the incoming particle is proportional to the number of particles that come out of the shower. And the reason for that is if you have the incoming energy of the particle at the first interaction, like let's say, or the first branching, wherever it is, I have a, a split into two particles. Okay? So each of these two particles is taking some fraction. Let's just say that it's half of the, the energy of the original particle. So the energy of the individual particles is getting reduced by a factor of two each time, but the total number of particles is increasing at basically this doubling rate. Okay? And in fact, the, when you get to the shower maximum, that is the point at which you have the maximum number of particles, so the widest shower here, you have a number of particles that's proportional to the incoming particle energy. It's actually that ratio E over EC, because EC tells you where it's going to cut off. So the, this number of, of particles at the shower maximum is exactly proportional to the energy of the incoming particle. That's what makes this a calorimeter. So I want to emphasize here, we're not really measuring the energy of each one of these electron, positron, photons that are inside the calorimeter. What we're really measuring is we're measuring the number of the particles that we have in here. We're only really measuring the number of charged particles. And the way that this works is we're actually uh, counting on ionization in part of the detector to tell us how many charged particles there are in the shower. So this is actually a little bit of magic. Counting the number of charged particles in the shower gives us the energy of the incoming particle. And especially for the electromagnetic showers, this is a very good, a very good uh, identity, a very good equation. So you can see here on the bottom the, the resolutions. Two things to remember. One is that the resolution on the energy goes as 1 over the square root of E. And the reason for that is that the, the resolution on the measurement has to do with the, the error on the number of particles that are measured. So if we think about measuring a large number of particles, the error on that is uh, root N. And since N is proportional to E, we get 1 over root E. Okay. And you can see also on the bottom line there that CMS has a much better resolution for the electromagnetic calorimeter than ATLAS does. And the reason for that is that CMS actually has special crystals that will completely absorb all the calorimeter or all the incoming particle energy, whereas ATLAS has some fluctuations that can happen because uh, ATLAS actually has a sandwich of active measuring chambers versus lead absorber. So the lead absorber, of course, doesn't allow you to measure the particles going through. That's just kind of dead material that's meant to, to shower the particles. But the CMS crystals are not only very dense, dense enough to create the shower, 
that actually are scintillating so that you can measure the shower at the same time. So those two are, are the difference between what's called a homogeneous calorimeter. This is the CMS calorimeter and the sampling calorimeter. Sampling calorimeter is called that because you really only sample the number of particles at different radiation lengths. It's not a continuous sampling of the particles. Okay. So the upshot of this is that you are, have a much better resolution for all these detectors whenever you measure, well, at high energies, you have a much better resolution in the calorimeter. At low energies, you have a better resolution in the tracker. So in general, if you're trying to measure particles that are below 20 GeV, they'll be most precisely measured in the tracker. And if you're looking at higher energy particles, they'll be most, uh, most well measured in the calorimeter. The particles for which that's very important are the electrons, of course. The electrons are measured not only through their track because they're a charged particle, but also in the calorimeter because they're electromagnetically interaction. Okay. So you can see that for low energy electrons, you would like to use the tracking measurement. For high energy electrons, you'd like to use the calorimeter measurement. What about particles that are neither strong nor um, electromagnetically showering? By the way, the, this shower here, because I told you the Bremsstrahlung only happens for at a rate that's 1 over m to the 4, electrons are really the only particles that shower in the electromagnetic calorimeter. The electromagnetic shower only happens for the electrons. Other charged particles that you might expect to have electromagnetic interactions do have electromagnetic interactions through the ionization. So they do have DEDX. You do see the tracks. But they don't shower because they don't Bremsstrahlung. So again, this is the case with the muons. So the muons don't produce an electromagnetic shower because they don't have Bremsstrahlung photons. And in fact, they don't interact in the hadronic shower either because they're not strongly interacting. So what happens to them? Well, they only lose a little bit of energy through ionization, through ionization energy loss. But basically, they make it all the way out to the edge of the detector. And since muons are the only particles, besides neutrinos, that make it out to the edge of the detector, this is our way of knowing that this particle is a muon. The fact that it made it through all that material in the calorimeter without strongly interacting or without Bremsstrahlung and pair production means that it must be a muon. Now, this actually makes it easy for us to see the, the muons. OK, let me summarize here. This is a picture of the CMS detector, which shows very clearly all the different slices that we just talked about here. So on the left-hand side, you have the tracker. And you can see that charged particles namely the muons and the charged hadrons and the electrons, have little hits in the tracker. And so these little hits represent DEDX at each one of these layers, okay? each one of these silicon layers in the tracker. Then some of the particles, let's just go in, in sequence here. So a photon dotted line, since it's not charged, it doesn't have any track. It doesn't leave any interaction in the tracking chamber. But it does reach the calorimeter, and it immediately pair produces and starts an electromagnetic shower. So you do have a shower from the photon here. OK, next we have the uh, uh, neutron. So a neutron has no track because it has no charge. It does not brem or pair produce in the calorimeter, so it doesn't have any signature here in the electromagnetic calorimeter. But it is strongly interacting. So a neutron does shower and does lose all of its energy, give up all of its energy in the hadron calorimeter. Okay, and we'll just keep going down here. So next is muon. You saw that the muon does have a charge, so it does have a track in the tracking chamber, and it passes through the rest of the detector. Lost my green light here. It passes through the rest of the detector out to the muon chambers, and the fact that it creates hits in the muon chambers helps us identify it as a muon. In other words, it's something that's not strongly interacting and something that's not light enough to brem in the, in the calorimeters. And then the last two we have are the electron and the pion. So the electron makes a shower, just like the photon in the electromagnetic calorimeter. And the green track there, the charged hadron, the pion, interestingly enough, gives a little bit of a shower in the electromagnetic calorimeter and a bigger shower in the hadron calorimeter. Actually, no. This is confusing picture here. 
This is a confusing picture because these two are passing through the same region of the electromagnetic calorimeter. This shower actually belongs to the electron, not to the pion. Okay. The pion does not interact there. The charge pion doesn't interact there. Someone was asking me today at lunch, what about the pi zero? Isn't the pi zero a neutral particle? How can we see neutral particles like the pi zero? Well, remember that Matt told you this morning that the pi zero decays immediately to two photons. So really, what comes out of the interaction point are the two photons. And the two photons make two showers that are very close to each other in the, actually right on top of each other, in the electromagnetic calorimeter. And really, if you think about it, the showers that you see from photons and electrons are very similar because the first step of the electron is to produce a photon. And the first step of the photon, if it were to come in, would be to produce an electron positron. Okay? So from there, the showers look exactly the same. It's only the very first uh, interaction that tells you or gives you some hint about whether it might be electron or photon. Actually, you have another big hint, too, which is the track. Photons don't have a track. The electrons have a track. So that's how you can tell the difference. OK? Yes? Do you need to? You don't need to. And the reason is that for what we'll be interested in, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, which is namely measuring the energy of a jet. Let me draw a jet as just being, in some sense, remember this is a physics jet, so it's actually uh, radiating and fragmenting to produce a bunch of particles, some of which are pi zeros, some of which are charged pions. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll measure these jets in the calorimeter as being a blob of jet energy. And we'll talk about what the uses are of the jets tomorrow. But in general, the pi zeros always come in the middle of jets. So adding up the energy of the jet as a whole is sufficient. You don't need to pick out the individual particles. Okay. Great. So I wanted to show you some of the, the events. People ask what the events look like. Here's an event before the tracking algorithm. This is in the Atlas detector. Can you find any tracks? Let me show you what we have here. So these hits in the middle are from the pixel detector, actually from the silicon detectors. Boy, I'm having a hard time. These are from the pixel detectors. So they're readout elements that are little squares instead of long strips or long wires. And here we have hits that are in the uh, strip detector. So again, silicon detector. These are solid state detectors out to here. And then here we have hits that are inside these little uh, wire tubes. So the tube that I drew with the wire going down the middle, that's what these are basically. This is the TRT for those of you in the know. And you can definitely see a lot of tracks. You can see a lot of particles passing through here. You can see particles curling up as they lose energy in the magnetic field and become tighter and tighter coiled. Wait till you see how many tracks are found by the tracking algorithm. Okay. So you might say, wow, that's, that's not very many. How come we're missing all those tracks? Well, in fact, the tracks that we're missing are the tracks that probably aren't very interesting for physics. That's why they're not, they're not flagged as tracks. So for example, here's a track. So this, part, this seems to, track seems to come from nowhere. And it sure doesn't come from the primary vertex, which is where all these other tracks come from. The key for doing this tracking is to try to find the tracks that really are associated with the physics production out here. So for example, you see that there are these links together of some of these particles or these curlers. For example, this thing here is probably something that reflected off the detector here and curled up inside here. What we're really focused on for the tracking is not necessarily finding every single particle that passed through the detector. Because there are lots of particles passing through the detector all the time, cosmic muons, uh, cavern background, slow neutrons that are just always present in the cavern. But we're really interested in finding the tracks that are going to tell us something about the collision. So when you look and see that there are apparently some tracks that aren't marked here, don't be alarmed. The reconstruction software makes certain cuts to make sure that we're only picking out the tracks that really come from the collision. How many does it need? Um, typically, in Atlas, we require something like three silicon hits and something like six hits outside of the silicon. So you really don't need too many. The more you require, the lower your efficiency will be. Okay. 
So let me just give you some rules of thumb here. One rule of thumb is that you, it will be very difficult to do tracking if you have more than 1% of, of the detector elements showing a hit. I mean, let's think about the limiting case. If you really had every single detector element showing a hit, how could you possibly know where the tracks were? Okay. And in fact, I, I guess I should say that uh, at the design luminosity, these outer hits, the ones where you have all the loopers and things like that, those will be over 50% occupied. So that will really limit the, the use of that detector as a tracking detector. The other thing that is tricky is that we would like to reconstruct some tracks that don't come from the primary vertex. Let me show you what I mean. So let's say we have a, a particle that's coming out. And let's say it's a photon that's coming out of a collision. I don't know. Let's say that we have a, a, a diagram that we're looking for, and it's it looks something like this. Let's say it's a, a Z. Well, let's say it's Z plus gamma, OK? So let's say I have a quark. Here's my quark. Here's the other quark, OK? So gamma Z. So if I were to look at the transverse plane, I should have a photon going out here. And I should have the Z, which then decays into some other particles that I'm not going to draw going this way. Well, let's say that the photon is going along its path, its invisible path, and it hits some material block. This material block could be the silicon detector itself. It could be a wall of some detector subsystem, something like that. Whenever it hits this material, it has the possibility to convert into an electron-positron pair. And now we have two tracks that if we were to continue their curvature in the magnetic field pretty obviously don't come from the primary vertex. But we want these. We want to find these because if we don't find them, we will never know that an important photon was produced at the primary vertex. So there are certain tracks that we do want to keep. Now, if this conversion happens in the second silicon layer, there is no track in the first silicon layer. So we have to have some new tracking algorithms that will let us work backwards and remember, these electrons still make showers out here in the calorimeter. So we work backwards from the calorimeter and do a backtracking so that we can find these tracks. Okay. We can find a few hits on the tracks, and we can say, aha, that must have been a converted photon. And in fact, these converted photons happen more often than we might like. So you have to have some material in your detector in order to measure the interactions, in order to measure the passage of the particles. The problem is the more material you put in your detector, the more likely you are to have poor photons convert into electron-positron pairs. And in fact, the, these detectors have so much material in them already that between 20 and 50% of the photons that are produced at the primary vertex convert by the time they make it to the calorimeter, before they make it to the calorimeter. So it varies between 20 and 50% because it depends on what eta they're produced. There's a lot more material at high eta. Okay. So the different things that we have to be careful of here that are our limitations of the reconstruction. One is what I just drew here, which is the conversion. So that's at the, the far left. The other is Bremsstrahlung itself. And the reason that Bremsstrahlung is difficult is that if you have an electron radiating a photon, and you pick up the electron cluster in here, and then the, elect the photon cluster might be by itself over here, you have basically mismeasured the electron as it's produced at the interaction point. And this would be important, because let's say the electron came from a Z. Well, you would like to measure exactly what the energy of that electron was, what the momentum of the electron was, bef when it was produced, before it radiated. So there needs to be some way to put these pieces back together to get us the original electron. And to make things worse, we have this special case here, which I'll call the trident, which can give you a fake conversion, give you a misreconstructed conversion by picking the wrong electron-positron pair. So all these things are difficulties in uh, doing the measurements. Okay. So I wanted to just uh, say a few words here on some of these exotic particle signatures. So I'll just take five more minutes, if that's okay. So some of the models predict charged massive particles. We already saw that the key to having an interaction in the tracking was having a charge. So if these particles are charged, they will deposit 
energy through ionization, energy loss in the tracker, so they can be tracked. Uh, if they're very high mass, and we're talking about masses that are 100 GeV or higher, then they have necessarily a low velocity. So instead of thinking about things that are essentially massless, which is what we talked about this morning, now you have something that's massive. So its velocity is not necessarily equal to C. It doesn't have a beta that's necessarily close to 1. So if the beta is significantly less than 1, then we have an increased energy loss through ionization, because you remember the 1 over beta squared in our original formula. And if it's slow enough, maybe we have some direct timing that we can do for these champ particles, these charged massive particles. Okay. There should be no, no EM showering because they're massive, they're 100 GeV. So they wouldn't necessarily interact in the calorimeter, in the electromagnetic calorimeter. But if they lose enough energy through ionization loss, which remember is enhanced by that, that beta squared, then they could just stop. They could actually stop in the middle of the detector before they decay, There's their, if they're stable particles. Okay. And in fact, people, have, people are planning to look for these particles. This is an example of a signature that's different from the standard model particles that we just learned about. If you have doubly charged particles, then instead of having uh, a Q, you have 2Q. That actually gets squared in the electromagnetic interaction because you have uh, the vertex that is proportional to the, the Q, and then that gets squared in the matrix element, so that alpha. So you would have four times the ionization. And as we saw, it's easy for us to measure the ionization. That's what we did with the DEDX. So you'd get another, another particle line but it would be much higher, four times higher than any of those other particles. Okay, I'm gonna skip our hadrons for a second in favor of non-pointing photons. So we've been assuming that these photons are really coming from the interaction point. And we're assuming that the, the showers that are in the calorimeter are pointing back to the interaction point. But this is not always the case. So we'll hear about some models in the next few days where we have displaced photons or non-pointing photons. So basically, these are photons that are produced not at the interaction point, not at the primary vertex, but at some larger radius. So they're the decays of some particle that travels a finite distance. And these non-pointing photons can be a challenge because the detector is all set up to measure particles that come from the interaction region, even to the extent of being a projective geometry. So I drew the circle that represented the detector around the beam line. And in fact, the calorimeter towers are segmented in such a way that they point back to the primary vertex. This is to make sure that the particles go into one of these towers and don't cross over between two of the towers. Okay, so a photon that comes out will go into one of these towers only. Now I ask you what happens whenever the photon is displaced or is produced at a displaced vertex. It can come out at some angle like this, and go through one or more towers. And so this is a challenge for the reconstruction program to find these photons, to identify them. So that's one more example. OK, and the last example I have, actually, stop gluinos are a special example of the champs. Um, they're not charged, but they do. They're not, in a, yeah, they're not charged, but they do stop in the detector, and then they'll decay at some later time. So the signature here is you have something that's not in time with a bunch crossing. People asked about the, how you know when the time is for the particle that entered the detector. Well, here you don't really have any idea. You know it happened at some time in the past. The signature here is to look for things that are not happening or particles that are decaying, but it is impossible for them to have come from the, the beams colliding. You can even do this when the beams are turned off. You can look for stock gluinos that might be hiding out in the detector and are waiting to decay. OK, last slide. So exotic signatures, the last one, is one that I think is very interesting. Instead of having two quarks that are on the end of a string that, that Matt alluded to this morning that will eventually break and make hadrons, you can have a different kind of color. This different kind of color might have a string that's not allowed to break because it doesn't have any lighter hadrons to break to. And so you would have two quarks, they're called, instead of quarks that are on the edge of the string. And the string might be forcing the two quarks to be oscillating around in a spiral as they move through the detector. 
or they might be at the end of a string that's moving back and forth like this. That is, the separation between the two might be different. So particles like this would not follow the normal curvature that you would expect from the Lorentz force alone. Sure, they'd be the Lorentz force because they're, they're charged somehow, so they might be curving, but they're also feeling another force. Okay, so it's a complicated orbit that doesn't match any of our, expect any of our expectations for tracking. So we'd have to do something different about that. Um, the last slide I won't go over is just for you to look at tonight. This is a definition of what some of you have been asking about as far as pile-up events, multiple parton interactions, uh, the definitions about all these things. So we'll be using these over the next few days. And whenever we say pile-up, uh, I wanted you to have a, a clear definition of what that means or multiple parton interaction. Okay. So have a look at this tonight, and then we'll go over it too in the next couple of days. Are there any other questions I can answer right now? It's not in the printout. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Then I will put it. I will put it in the printout uh, tomorrow, and so you have a copy of it. Okay. Thanks for reminding me of that. <laughs>